this uh, teenager comes in she is 15 years old hasn't had a period how do you uh, evaluate her I uh, would perform a history and physical. I would ask the patient if um, she has ever had a period, if she gets cyclical pain, when her um, mom or sisters had their first period. I would ask her if she notices any um, thickened hair at her chin, armpits, or pubic line. I would ask her if when she began to develop breasts um, or if she had developed breasts. I would ask about any changes in vision or headaches. I would then perform a hist uh, physical. Okay. Any any labs? Uh, I would order um, a prolactin and TSH to start. Uh, however, this would be contingent on the presence uh, of breast tissue as well. I would also, for imaging, order an ultrasound. If the TSH and prolactin were normal and the ultrasound showed the presence of a uterus, I would, on my physical exam, be looking for an imperfect hymen. Um, I would be looking for the presence of a uterus or of an, any ovarian cyst. If this was all normal, I would um, discuss with the patient um, the possibility of uh, doing a progesterone stim test. I would also order an FSH, LH, testosterone on um, 17 OHP. Okay, so... The beta H, uh, I would also perform an in-office in, in beta HCG. How would you... Um, what, are, what are the differentials? Or, first of all, what's the diagnosis? What's the um, definition of primary amenorrhea? Primary amenorrhea is the absence of thalarchy or menarche by the age of 13, or the absence of menarche with uh, thalarchy um, present by the age of 15. Oh, say that again? Sorry. Absence of both thalarchy and menarche by age 13. Absence of menarche in the presence of thalarchy at age 15. Okay. Um, and what would be your differential? My differential diagnosis would be um, possibly a hypothyroidism, prolactinoma. I would uh, be concerned about a, a malarian anomaly. I would be concerned about constitutional delay. Um, pregnancy would be a possibility. And I would also be concerned about um, if this patient had XY chromosomes with a antigen insensitivity syndrome. Okay. So let's say let's say this patient has a uterus but no breast development. What are your what are you, how do you uh, um how do you um what are the differentials for that one? A differential for a patient who has the presence of a uterus but no breast development um, would be concerned that there was um, no estrogen produced. So I would think that this was an XY uh, chromosome patient who um, lacked the SRY uh, gene or activation of anti-malarian hormones. So for this patient, I would be concerned about Swire syndrome. Um, it could also be a hypothalam hypothalamic hypogonadism, um, such as a Kalman syndrome patient. Okay. Any anything else? At this time, that is what I'm um, able to think of. However, any um, process that was able to block estrogen production or receptor receptor. Um, would initiate this issue. Okay. What would be a Turner patient? How would that how would that tur or a pa Turner patient present? A Turner patient could also present with shield chest. Um, 
uh, stage one tanner stage um, nipple development, amenorrhea, uh, streak uh, ovary. So this could potentially also be a uh, Turner syndrome patient. Okay. Uh, let's see. What if you have a patient who uh, who's eight years old and comes in comes in and has uh breast development with some pubic hair what would be your differential my differential would be precocious puberty um and the etiology would be gnrh independent or dependent okay and how would you evaluate this patient I would discuss with the mother um, when her family generally hits puberty to evaluate if this could be a constitutional um, puberty event. I would ask if there are any exogenous hormones to which the patient could have been exposed, whether if the father is using father or mother was using testosterone or topical estrogen. I would ask uh, when her symptoms first started. I would ask if she noticed any um, enlargement of her um, genital organs, such as clitoromegaly. I would ask um, if she had any um, facial hair or armpit hair. I would then um, perform a physical and order labs and imaging. Okay. Um, what is, uh, what is McCoon Albright's? McCune Albright is a um, genetic syndrome characterized by cafe au lait spots and precocious puberty. Um, and that is what I can tell you at this time. Okay. Um, all right. Let's stop there. Let's go over. For, uh, for precocious puberty, I would order um, FSH, LH, prolactin, um, estrogen, testosterone, and I would evaluate for an androgen tumor and then a brain tumor, right? And bone age? Yeah, bone. So it depends on if it's central versus peripheral. Yeah. Um, so I guess central, it's a lot of times it's uh, idiopathic. Um, yeah. Or it could be a CNS lesion. So yeah, um, in brain imaging, and then peripheral. So uh, McCoon Albright's or also tumor like ovarian type tumors. Yeah. It's yeah. or melanoma. Yeah. The only reason I asked you because is because the didn't didn't Cecilia had a basically she a McCoon did. Albright um, case. She yeah. did, but mm -hmm. I think that that's like for the genetics. I think it would just if I suspected this, I would refer to endocrinology. Right, but you still need to kind of give them something. You can't just be like, oh, oh, you can do genetic testing, GNAS. Okay. Yeah, genetic testing for the. It's like a somatic mutation. Yeah. Um. And then FSH, LH, TSH, and growth hormone. Growth hormone. Uh huh. IGF. G. G H growth, growth hormone. I have growth hormone. I don't know. Okay. Maybe maybe GnRH that would be, maybe be, be easier to to check. Well, oh, because there's insulin like growth factor, mm -hmm. but if I could just say to test for growth hormone, insulin like growth factor is the major mediator of growth hormone. And okay. and then you can do a, a GnRH agonist stimulation test. Um, yes. Yeah. And then the treatment is basically Lupron. Right. 
Lupron or whatever the the underlying factor, the reason is. Yeah. Well, yeah, unless it's a tumor, in which case we'd be replacing that. So for McCoon Albright, the treatment is to block the estrogen synthesis with aromatase inhibitors such as letrozole. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So did we talk about uh, hormone replacement therapy? Kind of pretty much. Um. um Non-hormonal is paroxetine, or you could do clonidine or gabapentin. Hormonal, transdermal doesn't have a VTE risk. Um, you could do topical testosterone for six months for decreased libido, otherwise micronized progesterone. Um, if they have a uterus, because that may have less breast cancer. Okay. That's pretty... Um, increases... Um, or decreases the risk for colon and uh, osteoporosis. Cannot confirm that it's protective of the health of the heart. Mm -hmm. And it decreases all cause mortality. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what would be your go to transdermal estrogen? My go-to transdermal is estrogel, um, or it, if they, the it's one pump, uh, 1.25 actuated, um, from the wrist to the shoulder daily. One pump. Oh, so it's like a spray? Yeah, it's like a lotion, like a lotion. Oh, I see. Um... I mean, um, I don't, I don't know that if that's like, uh, so All right, then I'll say Clamera. <laughs> the, 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 the reason is, um, cause like the sprays and stuff, you can like, it just, it's very, it's variable, right? It depends on how, how much the patient sprays. So I think yeah, a patch, a like a patch would probably be a little bit more, um, more stable. You can just say like a transdermal patch, 0 0.1 milligram estradiol patch. Because that one, you just put it on, on the body and then, you, you know, it gives you the exact amount of dosing. Um, and then um, and point, point 0.1 milligram is the equivalent of one, one, um, or was it one microgram or one milligram of oral? I'll, I usually I usually will do if I do the patch I do estradiol so I would just say or the uh, clamera so I would just say the estradiol 0. 0.025 milligrams per day. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let's see. Um. If the if a adolescent comes in with complaints of increased hair growth on their body and their face, what is your um or what is your evaluation? My evaluation asks the patient about any uh, medical issues, any medications that she on that she's on. I would ask if she is um, taking any medications to help with um, sports performance. I would ask when she first noticed these symptoms. I would ask about having a cycle monthly. I would ask about any changes in vision or headache, um, and I would ask about any recent weight gain, weight loss, or weight gain or hair loss. I would then order labs. I would then perform a physical and order labs and imaging. Okay. What what labs are you getting? If the patient was reporting a normal cycle, I would order a uh, total testosterone, DHEAS, prolactin, TSH. Um, and um, if the patient were obese, I would also order an A1C. I would also order an ultrasound to evaluate... Um, 
Well, if she had normal cycles, I would not necessarily require the ultrasound. Okay. What, what, are, you, what are you trying to... What are you looking for with the ultrasound if the patient doesn't have um, peri uh, regular periods? If she does not have regular periods, then I would be more suspicious for hyperandrogenism in the setting of PCOS, and I would be looking for um, ultrasound findings of PCOS. And I would also... Um, and add uh, a 17 OHP, excuse me, I would also add 17 OHP to my labs. Okay. Uh, is there a way to quantify the hirsutism or how do you diagnose someone who has hirsutism? There's the Faringway Galman scoring. Um, which assesses the hair distribution pattern. Okay. Um, did you say you're going to get a testosterone or no, or no testosterone? Yes, a total testosterone, so DHEAS, 17 okay. OHP, DSH uh, prolactin, A1C. Okay. And then what would be your uh, first line? treatment uh in a patient who um did not desire pregnancy my first line treatment would be ocps because it binds the sex hormone glo binding globulin or it increases sex hormone binding globulin which can bind the testosterone if it were um but i would try to determine what the ideology of her hirsutism is uh, otherwise we could try spironolactone or finasteride okay what would be your go-to um, birth control? My go-to birth control is uh, Junel. It's a Northendrone and um, Estradiol. Estradiol 1 uh, and Northendrone 20 micrograms. Okay. So for, for this patient, you don't have any um, specific um, birth control for her to try? That might work for patients better. that have for patients that have hirsutism. Um, I also consider Nextelis or uh, Yaz, both of which have drosperinone as their progesterone, which has anti-testosterone-like activity. Okay. Um, well, if okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's that's what I was looking for. Um, let's see. If this, if a uh, if a patient comes in with uh, severe headaches, um, that that is uh, correlated to their menses. It only comes on when when she has a um, menstrual period, and it goes away on its own after her menses. Um, what what it, what would you treat? How would you treat this patient? I would ask the patient to characterize her headaches. I would try to determine whether this was tension or migraine headaches. I would then try to further evaluate if it were a migraine with aura. Um, I would counsel the patient that she could take a, a beta blocker or daily magnesium, which could help prevent them, but that ultimately, um, or NSAIDs as well, however, she could um, take continuous medication to prevent her periods, which would be another option. Okay. What if the patient has migraine with aura? And in that case, I would counsel the patient that she could continue, she could still skip her cycles. Um, however, her options would be limited to progesterone only, such as a levonorgestrel IUD, um, etogestral implant, etonogestral implant, or um, hydroxyprogesterone um, Depo-Provera injection, or a progesterone-only pill. Okay. All right. Oh, uh, I think you forgot uh, triptans. Or did you I, say, the did patient... you say triptans or no? 
No, but that's also like not first line anymore. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, NSAIDs are first line, or yeah, NSAIDs, magnesium, calcium channel blocker, mm -hmm. reglin, inexplicably. <laughs> um, yeah, but you're right. Okay. Uh, let's move on to. I'm just going through my notes to see what else to ask you. Um, what? So let's let's talk about Lynch syndrome. Um, what are the cancers? They're common in Lynch syndrome. The most common cancers in Lynch syndrome are colon and uterine. Um, however, I believe there is a risk for ovarian as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, actually the second most common cause of hereditary ovarian cancer. Uh, um, yeah. After BRCA. That's BRCA. Yeah. Yeah. So uh is it uh, dominant or recessive I believe it is autosomal dominant okay mm. what are the screening or preventative strategies you can um counsel the patient at, on for a patient with Lynch, Lynch syndrome, you would start colonoscopies by age um, 25 or 10 years prior to the earliest colon cancer. Um, you, would, you could consider starting endometrial biopsies, I believe, at 35 um, and counsel on risk reduction, risk reductive um, hysterectomy and bilateral salpingectomy. Um, age 50 but i it may be earlier and i would um, co-manage this patient with an oncologist okay. after lunch um so on my notes it said uh starting at 20 colonoscopy annually starting at 20 or five years before the earliest cancer diagnosis in the family um the 25, I feel like that's BRCA, but you can double it's check. It's definitely out. BRCA. Yeah. Let me look. Oh. Instruct me in BSO early 40s. Um. Colonoscopy could start by age 25 or two to five years before the earliest cancer. An endometrial biopsy beginning 30 to 35. Oh, okay. Oh. I thought I just picked the, the earliest. Because um, I, I don't have a range. I just picked probably, I just probably yeah. picked the earliest you can start doing. Less things for yeah. you to remember. Uh, That's I'm like, I think I picked the by age yeah right exactly um okay uh, is there any medication let's say the patient doesn't want surgery is there any medication you can start her on to prevent i don't know any type any cancer you could um, begin OCPs as chemoprophylaxis for ovarian cancer, and you could do, uh, or you could do a um, levonorgestrel IUD. Did you say ovarian cancer? Or yeah. Okay. 
You can do OCPs for ovarian cancer and live on adrenal for an endometrial cancer. Although, very, uh, you know, OCPs would decrease the risk for both. Okay. Um, let's see. But okay, and then yeah, hysterectomy and BSO for someone who's completed childbearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, what are the the types of hysterectomies? So, uh, for benign hysterectomies, there are vaginal hysterectomies, the laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomies, laparoscopic hysterectomies, or abdominal hysterectomies. I was referring more of um of like the the amount of tissue when it comes to radical hysterectomies there are different levels in regards to how much of the parametria um broad ligament and ip ligament are removed which is based on the um cancer that is being treated okay so what would be a simple, uh, what would be an, another name for a simple hysterectomy? I believe that would be a hysterectomy type 1, but truthfully, I uh, do not have as much familiarity with this type of grading. Yeah, you're, you're correct. Type 1 or extra fascial. All right. Um... One time I tried to answer during sign-outs because they asked, like, what type of hysterectomy. And I was like, I know that there's five grades. And Baum was just like, shut up. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I don't know. I've never even seen one. Yeah. Uh... Okay. Did we talk about blood, blood products? I feel like we no, did. we can do that. Okay. So, what is in FFP? FFP is fresh frozen plasma and other clotting factors. Other clotting factors. What? Um, which ones? It contains the ones that are present within cryoprecipitate, um, and I believe includes factors um, 10, 7, and 9, as well as factor 5, but I would double check. Okay. How, what's the, um, how much is in f fresh frozen plasma? Like, number of cc's? Or MLs. I believe that it increases volume by about um, 150 mLs. Okay. And what's the difference between FFP and uh, a cryo? Cryo is made from FFP um, and contains von Willebrand factor. Okay. And uh, volume? I believe it's 50 mLs. Okay. So, uh, FFP contains all the clotting factors, including fibrinogen. Um, and it's around, you know, 150 to 200 mLs. Um, and then cryoprecipitate is 50 mLs, but it's, f it's five units um, total of 50 ml. So each cryo unit is 10 cc's and it contains 813 von Willebrand and fibrinogen. So like if you want to not out volume overload a patient, you want to give cryo versus FFP um, and there is more fibrinogen in FFP than in cryo so 200 milligrams of fibrinogen in 
cryo uh, cryo cryo and then uh, 500 in ffp oh, wait how many is in cryo 200 milligrams of fibrinogen 200 and then 500 okay around 500 yeah and then if ffp increases the factors by uh, about three per three percent per um each use per per unit through the like a lot of this stuff, my brain just like doesn't store yeah that's what i'm like I mean, working out like i've looked at this abc blood component therapy lecture probably a couple times i think the main you just have to remember like one or two main things about each thing that's that's how i look at it yeah. Cause one they don't have a lot of time to go into really detail but so you know you just have to remember like the most important thing so i guess for blood products i would i would think it's the um the flat you know the factors right and then the you know amount of fibrinogen that's in there mm -hmm. um and then the, the amount like the the um the amount like the volume so volume and f factor i mean i don't i don't think you need to remember every factor like clotting factor but ffp is really easy to remember it's all all of it plus you know yeah the fibrinogen that's the most important versus cryo is less of fibrinogen and then you said von willebrand so yeah and it's a lot less volume i think you just need to remember that those two and it should be fine Yeah, just a little bit of everything, I guess. Yeah. That's, that's what you need to know. Uh, all right, let's move on to OB for a little bit. So I have a patient who um, came in, this is her first pregnancy. The baby is, um, is about nine weeks and um, you have a suspicion that it might be a, a, a missed abortion. How would you diagnose a missed abortion? There are um, a few different factors. One would be a crown rump length of seven millimeters without a uh, evidence of fetal heart tones, a gestational sac of 2.5 centimeters without uh, uh, fetal pole, um, or if it were two weeks from the formation of a gestational sac with no evidence of uh, fetal pole or yolk sac. Okay. Um, what if the let's say she she comes in at um I don't know twenty twenty eight weeks and you're trying to figure out her gestational age. What are some of the things that you could use? I would um, ask the patient about. Uh, first day of last natural period, if it was regular, if she remembers her first um, positive pregnancy test, I would ask how many um, weeks she's been able to feel fetal movement. Generally, uh, patients are able to feel fetal movement starting around 20 weeks. Um, and if I had an ultrasound under 22 weeks confirming her um, first day of last menstrual period, that would be um adequate or um any of those factors with an ultrasound of the second trimester that was within plus or minus 14 days of her lmp okay mm. what would be what would be the single most accurate measurement you could do for a 28 weeker the most accurate would be the femur length um let's 
Let's see. So, um, if this patient has, or well not this patient, if anybody has um, uh, a fetal growth restri restricted uh, fetus, how would you evaluate this patient or how would you manage this patient? In a patient with good gestational dating, I would evaluate maternal, fetal, or placental causes. So for maternal causes, I would be concerned about uh, smoking or drug abuse, as well as chronic hypertension. Uh, in terms of fetal causes, I would be concerned about infection or genetic anomaly. Um, and for placental, I would be concerned about a um, marginal cord insertion or two vessel cord. Um, or velamentous cord or succinturiate lobe. Okay. Did you talk about like hypertension and stuff? I did oh, for okay. maternal causes. Okay, okay. Smoking, smoking drugs, hypertension. Got it. Okay. Um, how would you uh, how would you manage this patient though? If a patient had uncomplicated fetal growth restriction with an estimated fetal weight under the 10th percentile, um, but over the third and AC um, circumference over the third percentile, then we would do twice weekly NSTs. Our NSTs are modified BPPs. I would um, consult maternal fetal medicine for serial growth scans. And assuming there was um, ongoing fetal growth and reassuring Dopplers, excuse me, the maternal fetal medicine would also be performing uh, Dopplers once weekly. As long as the UA Dopplers and fetal growth were reassuring, then we would continue the pregnancy to 39 weeks. 30, 39 weeks? With um, adequate, with ongoing growth and reassuring Dopplers, Yes. All right, let me, let me double check, it, check that. For uncomplicated fetal growth restriction, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you sh you should 39. Know you had a, you have Cecilia with a... Yeah, hers, hers was complicated. She had estimated fetal growth in the third percentile. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's where she had to deliver at 37. Okay, 38 and 39. Okay. All right. Let's see. Uh, I think I asked you this one before. Um, what is the, what are the, uh, genetic screening, um, uh, that you offer the, uh, your pregnant patients? The, uh, genetic screening that we offer is the cell-free DNA test after 10 weeks. Um, and we offer the, um, Horizon 14, uh, panel for our routine genetics, um, which includes, um, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, fragile X, and cystic fibrosis. Okay. Is there anything else you do? If it is a patient with twins, we also recommend uh, nuchal translucency. Um, and for all patients in the um, that are amenable to genetic screening after 15 weeks, we recommend doing the second trimester AFP for all neural tube defects. And all patients um, get a anatomy scan between 18 and 22 weeks. Okay. So what is the, um, what is the detection rate of a uh, cell-free DNA for Down syndrome? For cell-free DNA, um, for detection sensitivity for Down syndrome, it is um, between 95 and 98 percent. However, yeah. And that's what I'll say. It's between ninety five and ninety eight percent. Okay. Detection rate for um actually detection rate for Down syndrome is ninety nine percent. Okay. Yeah. Uh 
because that's that's sensitivity right so sensitivity is actually yeah. really high um 95 to 98 percent i'm not sure what those numbers are for um i think that's trace me 13. yeah well it's it also accounts for the fact that depending on the population even though it's sensitive it's not specific but okay. yeah i should just say 90, 98 to 99 percent yeah um what about positive positive predictive value Positive predictive value is contingent on the population. It has a good positive predictive value um, in the advanced maternal age group. However, it is less um, reassuring in the or less accurate in the 25 or less than 35 year old age group. Okay. Um, let's say th this patient, she is 25 years old she comes in uh she's pregnant she had a um uh, an ipt done and um it's positive how would you counsel this patient i would counsel the patient that this is a screening test it is not diagnostic and that we should not yet make any decisions about the outcome of the pregnancy i would counsel that we should um that I will refer her to the perinatologist for diagnostic testing, which can be sampling of the amniotic fluid in a test called an amniocentesis, and that that will let us know whether or not the um, screening test is accurate. Um, what if the patient says, uh, uh, I heard it's very dangerous? The... Um, at this, the initial studies did show that there was a higher uh, risk to the pregnancy. However, at this point, um, it is not considered a high-risk pregnancy. And though there is a risk for um, pre-term, uh, pre-term pre labor ruptured membranes, um, possible limb defects, that is not a likely outcome of the test. Okay. Can you, can you give me a, a percentage of, of, of fetal loss? for amniocentesis? I believe that it is less than one in 500. Okay. Uh, do, do, do. Let's see. Um, are there any, so uh, it sounds like NIPT is uh, very accurate to detect um, trisomy 21 and what are there any downsides to um an ipt it is less um it can be less accurate in twins if there is maternal obesity um and again um based on the patient's population age okay what if like um what if the patient did a and IPT came back uh, inconclusive or non result I, I would ask the patient at what gestational age she had the testing done. Um, however, I would be concerned that this could indicate an abnormal fetus. If the patient did this after 10 weeks, I would then um, refer to maternal fetal medicine for diagnostic testing. Okay. So you wouldn't repeat repeat it again if it's after 10 weeks i would not uh the test should have a result after 10 weeks in a patient with a normal body habitus and if the patient's body habitus is large as in if this is a patient who is class 3 obesity then repeating the test uh, would not necessarily result in a uh outcome but could delay further testing okay sounds good Mm, let me see. Uh, uh, gonna, I feel like we went over a lot of these things already. Um, this patient, uh, 
so this patient had a um IUGR baby and you ordered a uh a, a C, the CMV test uh, it came back positive um how would you counsel this patient or let's say how, how how do you um so the IgG came back positive how do you interpret that no. the number or the the uh, IgG results I would then need to assess the avidity as a high avidity would mean that this uh, infection had been long standing and a low avidity would mean that it is recent Okay. Um, would you get a uh, IgM? I would order an IgM, but I believe that the value is in the avidity. Okay. Mm, so how how would you counsel this patient? I just say uh, I came back with um, low avidity. I would counsel the patient that she most likely has a um, infection that was in the past few months and that this could be a risk to her neonate. I would recommend um, maternal fetal medicine consult, uh, monitoring for any fetal effects, and um, we would be monitoring for growth restriction and any fetal abnormalities. Okay. Um, would you try to test the baby? You can also test the amniotic fluid, um, to assess for infection. Okay. Is there any treatment? I... Would co-manage this patient with the maternal fetal medicine specialist, but I do not believe that there is an antiviral. Okay. What if the patient? How would you diagnose uh, uh, a parvo virus, a parvo um, B nineteen, in a pregnant patient? I would be. I'd be suspicious per uh, parvo if a patient had flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, um, and a rash, as well as the slap cheek appearance. I would order a blood test, um, IgM, IgG. Um, if it were positive, I would recommend um, assessment of the amniotic fluid. And uh, I would then counsel the patient that we would need to monitor the neonate um, in conjunction with co-management with the MFM in regards to fetal anemia. Okay. And fetal anemia is monitored how? With MCA Dopplers. Okay. Okay, pretty good. What if the patient has um, the rash and then you did a, um, a blood test and, and came back with uh, uh, a varicella positive? If this patient um, showed varicella, then I would order um, a cyclovir for this patient. If she had severe symptoms, I would order IV acyclovir and keep her inpatient. I would counsel the patient that the risk for the neonate is greatest if um, delivery occurs within the next um, 72 hours. And I would notify NICU if the patient were to go into labor. Next 72 hours. I think it's within five think, days. Yeah, I think it's five days. Five days yeah. before delivery and two days postpartum. Yeah. Um, okay. And then... 
yeah, not bad. That's uh, I I think that's like the harder harder questions. Um, let's see. Uh, what are the risk factors for uh preterm labor or preterm birth? Risk factors. Risk factors for preterm um, labor include maternal and fetal risks. So maternal risks include advanced maternal age, chronic hypertension, uh, diabetes, gestational diabetes. Um, the uh, fetus, if there was multi-gestation, um, genetic anomalies. Um, and then in terms of the uterine factor could be if there was um, cervical insufficiency or malarian anomalies. Okay. Let's say a, a patient has a um, prior preterm birth. Um, how would you manage her subsequent pregnancy? I would first ask if I it would, was a spontaneous yeah. I would first ask if it was spontaneous or if this was a medically indicated preterm birth. I would ask if she had preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, if this uh, or if her um, water had broken, if this was a patient who um, spontaneously went into preterm labor under 36 weeks, then uh, we would do serial cervical monitoring. If there was evidence of cervical shortening, then we would offer um, vaginal progesterone or a uh, sarcoge um, in conjunction with ma uh, maternal fetal manage maternal fetal medicine management okay so would you would you use or would you offer vaginal progesterone if the patient had um, uh, what are the indications for vaginal progesterone again Vaginal progesterone, I believe, is indicated with a history of preterm birth and a cervix less than 25 millimeters. Okay. What about a saccage? Would you, would Sir, you offer Kaj, a saccage um, in this uh, instant? You can offer a saccage um, for the same indication as you, you would um, for the vaginal progesterone, so history of preterm birth um, and cervix of 25 millimeters. You also could offer a cerclage if an ultrasound with no history of preterm birth and ultrasound indicated a cervical length of one centimeter, or if the patient was identified to be two centimeters under 24 weeks with the uh, amniotic fluid intact. Wait, say that last one again. The physical exam finding if they're dilated, but the... Oh, dilated, um, okay. Yeah, one okay. to two centimeters dilated. Got it. Uh, okay. Do you do saccages? Yes. Okay. What are the different saccages? The different saccages are McDonald and uh, Schrodkar. However, I only have familiarity with the process of placing a McDonald's or clutch. Okay. What well, what would be the difference? McDonald's or clutch is a circumferential circlage placement. Um, and I believe that the Schroed car is uh includes an incision into the cervix and encloses it underneath the um, tissue. However, in truth, I would want to look it up before answering. Okay. No one does that. I think it's usually for people who has like a, um, no cervix left or something. Like if they had like a, you know, a leap or like a trachelectomy or something like that. Or is that for abdominal clashes? That's abdominal. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, it's a transverse incision made in the vaginal mucosa of the anterior cervix. Yeah, I think it's just for people who have really short cervixes. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay. Uh, I think you got all the all the points. Um. Do do do. Um. Let's say this patient comes in thirty. 32 weeks, um, she is uh, having contractions. Um, and her cervix is uh, one centimeter dilated. How would you uh, evaluate and manage this patient? I would ask the patient, um, what number of pregnancy this is, if she had any complications during this pregnancy or prior pregnancy, I would ask when the contractions began, if there was any um, trauma, injury, anything that precipitated her contractions. I would ask if she's had any prior surgeries or history of preterm birth or history of sur uh, surgery on the cervix. I would ask about medications that she's taking or drug use. Um, I would also ask any allergies. I would then... Um, during this, I would also be evaluating the fetal heart tracing, which would be present on the screen next to me and the presence of contractions. I would um, initially order a urinalysis, CBC and type in screen. Um, if the urinalysis or urine dip showed initially ketones or bacteria, I would begin IV hydration and then um, wait for the complete analysis. If this was a UTI, I would then treat. Okay. Um, if the patient's UA was clear uh, and the patient was continuing to contract, I would um, consider giving betamethasone. I would continue the IV hydration and I would begin um, procardia through the uh, steroid window. I would also order an ultrasound to confirm fetal position. Okay. Would uh, if this patient is thirty weeks, would the would 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 that change your management? I would use uh, magnesium for neuroprotection. Okay. Any changes? But in otherwise, tocolysis or anything like that. I do not. I generally do not. Um, combine procardia and magnesium because of the small risk for pulmonary edema. Um, although it's not first line, if the magnesium decreased the contractions, I would continue that through the steroid window. However, at 30 weeks, indomethacin would also be an option. Okay. Um... I think you forgot um, uh, GBS prophylaxis. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's if she made change. But yes, I would get a GBS swab as well. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Which transmission? Okay, what if the patient... What if the patient has um, a history of HSV in this case? I would ask the patient if she was having any prodromal symptoms, when was her last outbreak, um, and I would begin um, valcyclovir, um, and I would assess for any herpetic lesions. Okay. What if she's ruptured at 30 whatever weeks? And I would begin, um, if a patient came in confirmed ruptured, excuse me, for the preterm labor patient, I would also evaluate for rule out rupture. 
Um, if a patient presented with rule out with ruptured membranes at 32 weeks, I would begin um, IV access, order an ultrasound, begin beta methasone. I would order GBS swabs, and I would begin um, anti excuse me. I would begin antenatal steroids and latency antibiotics. Uh, what what antibiotics would you use? We use um, ampicillin two grams every six hours for the first forty eight hours, followed by amoxicillin two fifty milligrams every eight hours, and um, we use azithromycin five hundred milligrams PO for the first two days, followed by erythromycin three hundred thirty three milligrams every eight hours for the next five days. Okay. What if she is um, uh, am, uh, allergic to penicillin? Depending on her um, penicillin allergy, if it's a mild um, allergy, then we would uh, use ANSEF instead of the amoxicillin um, for the medication. Okay. And what if she's uh, severe? And we would likely use vancomycin, um, and we would order the GBS swab with sensitivities for penicillin. Excuse me, with clindamycin. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I, pre I don't want, like, have any more to ask you. I feel like you did pretty well. Hey, thank you. Yeah. It's also scary. Why? I mean, like, me asking Because I don't want to fucking fail. No, I just oh, don't want to uh, fail. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Who does? <laughs> Yeah, For course. osteoporosis, if they're under 65, you initiate treatment if, um, like, let's say that they had risk factors, so they had uh, DEXA, and the T-score um, showed uh, low bone density, and then the FRAX was 8.4, you'd initiate bisphosphonates? The 8.4 is when you, um, when you're, it's for screening, like, if it's, uh, if they're less than 65, but their FRAX score is 8.4 or above, then, then you, you do DEX. Then you do a DEX. DEXA. Right. Okay. The, the one that you're talking the... about is 3% major uh, osteoporotic fracture and 20%, oh no, 20% major uh, osteoporotic fracture and 3% uh, feet, like a, uh, like a big bone fracture. Um, what is that called? The femur. Yeah, femur femur, yeah. Is fine. femur yeah. fracture. Yeah. So there's two uses okay. for FRAC score. So, okay. So if they're under 65, then I would use a FRAC score to, for the risk factors. And that's what would I, when I would get a DEXA. Uh huh. And then once I had the DEXA, I would then again use a FRAC score. No, no, no. The, if you have a DEXA, and it's not osteoporotic, uh, osteoporosis. It's, it's right? just so low it's a, bone density. Right. Then you use the FRAC score again. Yeah. But you, only if you're over 65. No, that's no, a no, second no. osteoporosis. What, when you, whenever you use DEXA, after the DEXA, you get a score, right? It doesn't matter wh yeah. why you used it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but let's say it's you, low bone density. Correct. And then I use a you use it okay. again, like, you know, if, it's, the, if they're okay, less than 65, okay, that's what you, I said. you will use it again. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So under 65 and over 40, I'd use a FRAX to guide if I order the DEXA. Once I have the DEXA, if she's osteopenic, I would do a FRAX again. If she's osteoporotic, I would just start meds. Right. All right, cool. Yeah, cool. you'll be fine. I promise. <laughs> I really appreciate. Thank you for helping for um, studying with me today. Of course. Yeah, it'll take your mind off of uh, off of the everything a little bit.
Yeah, I'm just going to look at STDs tonight and then um, BRCA indication and Lynch indication, and I think that's it. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep at all, so 